Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's right at six o'clock. We're going to allow a few more minutes so that other attendees can continue to join. We're expecting a pretty large group to come with, here with us tonight and receive the information we have for you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. We're continuing to see a lot of folks join us tonight. Uh, so we're going to probably wait another three or four minutes to make sure that those that registered are able to attend. Uh, we're looking about a fifth of the folks that registered are already with us. And so we'll just allow a little bit more time to see if anyone else does join. Um, and we are also working on streaming this on Facebook Live. So if you have other folks that are interested in hearing what we have today, please encourage them to visit or check out our BLM New Mexico Facebook page, and that's at Bureau of Land Management New Mexico.
All right, everyone, it looks like our attendees are starting to slow down as they're coming in. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your lives to join us today uh, to hear some information about the Bureau of Land Management's Chaco area proposed withdrawal. You might have seen quite a few things published, either a press release or in the Federal Register. So we're here today to give you some information about, about what this is and then answer any questions you may have about the proposal. Uh, we, have, we have a lot to go through on our day, so I'll ask our moderator to move to the next slide so I could share our agenda with you. All right. Uh, so right now we're doing our welcome and then we'll move on to our uh, some introductions. We'll go over some meeting logistics and then we'll, we're gonna provide an informational presentation. After that, we're gonna open it up for a question and answer session and then we'll adjourn. I just wanna be clear today on what this is versus what it is not. Again, we are here to answer any questions you may have about this proposal. However, we are not accepting formal comments today. The agency is committed to doing additional outreach on this, on this project so we can hear from you and so expect to see some additional opportunities for engagement and for us to receive your comments in March. And so we're working out those logistics right now and more information will be available here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we are also trying to get this session streamed live on Facebook. And so I'll be working behind the scenes a little bit right now as we finish getting through that process. Um, but let's just go ahead and start going through our introductions. Uh, next slide, please. First, I would like to introduce our uh, Bureau of Land Management, New Mexico Acting State Director, Melanie Barnes. Hi, everyone. Really a pleasure to be here and thanks for being here this evening. Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Chuck Schmidt. I'm your acting district manager for Farming District. Really appreciate you taking the time out with us this evening. Next slide, please. All right, Mr. Jeff Tapoya. Good evening, everybody. Jeff Tapoya, assistant field manager for Lands and Renewable Resources here at BLM. Thanks for joining us tonight. And Dave Mikovich. We might got, have gotten a little caught up. Uh, we do have the director for the Federal Indian Minerals Office, Maureen Joe, with us as well. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Maureen Joe, and I am the director over at the Federal Indian Minerals Office. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Eric Simpson. Uh, this is Eric Simpson, archaeologist with the BLM in Farmington. This is Dave Mankiewicz. I'm going to slip in here. I didn't unmute myself. I'm the AFM for minerals here in Farmington. Thanks, Dave. Al Elser. Good evening, everyone. I'm Al Elser. I'm the Acting Deputy State Director for Minerals for the BLM New Mexico State Office. And my normal job is actually the District Manager for the Farmington District Office, which I'll be returning to on Monday. Thanks for coming. Matt Dorsey. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Dorsey. I'm the uh, GIS specialist here with the Farmington District Office. I apologize. My uh, GIS workstation doesn't have a uh, video camera. Ryan Joyner. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Joyner. I'm the Planning and Environmental Coordinator here in Farmington. Thank you. And Sarah Scott. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Scott, the project manager at the Farmington Field Office. Thanks for being here. Great. And I failed to mention who I am. I'm Jillian Aragon. I'm a public affairs specialist for the Farmington District Office. A few logistics to go over. First, if you haven't already noticed, we do have live transcripts available at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you need something additional to fit 
your needs, uh, please click that more button at the bottom of your screen. And if you already have some uh, programs on your phone or on your computer that can assist you, you should be able to connect those there. Um, as stated previously, following the informational presentation, uh, we will have that question and answer session with you and more instructions on how that'll go. Um, we'll, we'll approach that once it comes to that time. And again, this is for a question and answer session and we will uh, sh share with you some additional information on how you can provide comments before we get to those uh, hearing sessions that we're currently planning for March. And also this is being recorded. And so our plan is to keep this entire presentation and your question and answers recorded and then go ahead and post it on the e-planning webpage. Next slide. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to the Acting Farmington District Manager, Chuck Schmidt, to go ahead and give you the informational presentation. Okay, folks, uh, once again, really do appreciate you taking time out of your day to, uh, to participate with us uh, tonight. Uh, we uh, very much want to uh, get correct information out, so, uh, and we are also soliciting comments, so we want you to, to have as good of information as possible uh, for you as we uh, move through this process. And so, what, why are we doing what, what's going on? And uh, so really the purpose of this meeting uh, is, is one to familiarize yourselves and, and ourselves too, by the way, uh, that uh, this, this process is different than our normal process to where we might be working on uh, a NEPA document for approval of, uh, of an activity that someone has brought to us or say a planning document like uh, we're engaged with uh, uh, here in Farmington on our resource management plan amendment. This process is driven uh, by 43 CFR 2310, uh, and uh, it's required for us to hold these meetings uh, for anything greater than 5,000 acres uh, for a withdrawal. Uh, for those of you that want, uh, you see the, the reference there, or actually you don't, I, I think a, a future slide will, but it's under 43 CFR 2310.13-1. So these meetings are intended to provide information. Uh, this is the third that we've done since uh, in the last uh, two days. And what we did learn uh, from the first two sessions and, and uh, perhaps some uh, on with us tonight, uh, we're at those uh, in-person meetings, is uh, we do intend, and Jill uh, just mentioned, uh, in, here in the future, uh, probably within the next month, we will have additional meetings to where we will have uh, court reporters uh, in place to where we could actually capture verbal comments. Uh, we did hear that loud and clear, and uh, we will be uh, hosting at least two of those uh, tentatively planned right now, at least one in the Rio Grande Corridor, uh, say Albuquerque or Santa Fe, and uh, the other one uh, currently planned back here in Farmington. Uh, so what we, what we really hope uh, after the conclusion of tonight is that you folks uh, gain the knowledge of what we're actually uh, preparing to do. And uh, we, we wanna encourage dialogue in that understanding. Uh, to be included on the official record for this portion of the withdrawal effort, we do need written comments currently and uh, after we uh, host those next two meetings and that will afford the opportunity for comments to be made verbally and captured. And so as, as we go through this process, these comments will be uh, packaged up uh, and, and submitted on up to the Secretary of Interior's office. Uh, next slide, please. Whoa. We'll, we'll get it here. So yeah, slide nine. Okay. So what we're talking about and why we're here tonight is uh, <clears throat> last November, uh, and many of you may be aware, but Secretary Holland uh, visited the Chaco Park and announced uh, a withdrawal of a 10 mile buffer around the park itself. And so as we started uh, and, and we were tasked with, uh, uh, as the Bureau of Land Management, as being the agency uh, responsible for uh, 
processing that withdrawal action. So the proposed uh, location as we started working through it and the calculations out, it's uh, basically 351,000 acres, folks, is, is what we're talking about. And it's going to remove those acreage. And, and, and don't think just land, this is actual the mineral entry, and we'll get to that here in a bit, uh, from a location, uh, locations and locatable entry under US mining laws and leasing under U.S. mineral leasing laws. We will, the, uh, that, that action in itself, uh, if implemented, will uh, limit surface disturbing activities that would re be related to those activities. This was published in the Federal Register on January 6th. And what it did is uh, once it was published, those lands identified uh, were now segregated, and that's a, a term that's used and set aside for two years, basically puts them uh, as if this withdrawal was in place. And what that's allowing is under that two year timeline, we have to work through this process and, and, uh, and to, to allow the secretary to consider uh, the 20 year withdrawal uh, after we complete that. So it kicked off a 90 day comment period, uh, started on uh, January 6th, and it's going to end on April 6th. So uh, we've got uh, four to five weeks left for the comments for this portion. This withdrawal only applies to federally managed minerals. This does not apply to private lands, state lands, Indian allotted lands, Navajo trust lands, or any other lands out that may be in this area. It is strictly the federally managed minerals. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, we're there. Sorry, guys, we're, we're having a little bit of uh, back and forth here. So the proposed withdrawal area, and I love maps and, and they, they speak volumes and, and hopefully you guys can uh, see this map well enough uh, to, to see the, the shaded areas, or if you see very good on there, it's actually got diagonal cross hatching in it. Those are the, the federal minerals. It's 351,000 acres within that. And if you look at the 10 mile buffer around it, you'll see the, uh, the purple uh, in the center of that map where it's talking and identifying the Chaco Cultural Natural Historical Park. It's 10 miles around that. But you also see other units of that, uh, like down to the south there into uh, uh, further south is the Kenya Ah uh, portion of that. So there'd be a 10 mile buffer around that. And then off uh, to, to the uh, to the east side there, it'd be the uh, Pueblo Pintada portion of it. Also, uh, you'll see that it kind of jogs up to the north, uh, following the, the boundary of the Vistai Denison Wilderness Area and down. This map closely uh, resembles uh, proposed legislation from 2019, and it was what was provided to the BLM uh, for the analysis and processing of this action. If you look close, and, and probably, and it depends on your computer screen, but you will actually see it's a jagged edge uh, instead of a nice smooth arc, as if you would think about drawing a circle in a 10 mile boundary. The reason for that is we had to uh, define the areas uh, of aliquot parts, and it's in the legal land description. And so based on the public land survey system, we have to identify and be able to legally uh, describe those parcels. So because that is a very angular process based on, on the public land survey, it's minor and, and at this scale, it looks like an arc, but it's actually a jagged edge and it's following actual aliquot boundaries on that. Okay, next slide. I think I may have skipped this one, Chuck. Okay, I yeah, I, 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 and I, I'm having some technical ends on my side too, so. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so we're back to slide nine. And I think I pretty much covered 
folks, everything uh, that we had going. Uh, sorry, folks. Like we we, we had rehearsed better than this. So, would you like to go to the next slide following the? Yeah, map? Let, let's go ahead and move on to slide 10, please. Thanks, Chuck. Okay. Did the numbers get messed up, folks? Because, yeah, we moved a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Let's go back there too. Bear with us. We are not the masters, folks, at the Zoom sessions. And, uh, and, and yours truly is probably the part, the majority of the part of the, the issue here. I can take this off. Sure, please do. Okay. As we've all learned through the pandemic, of sometimes these amazing. Uh, databases that we're using don't always work perfectly, and so it doesn't matter how much we prepare and try to bring you the best information when our computers don't work, they don't work. So I'm going to go ahead and step in, and we'll, we want to make sure you get all the information that we have available to you. So, Teresa, let's go to the does and does not slide. Thank you. And so, again, the secretaries here, uh, the secretary, the Department of the Interior, and the Bureau of Land Management are here to, uh, we're proposing a 350,000 acre withdrawal of public lands from location and entry uh, surrounding Chaco Park. And this is done under various mining laws, um, but it's not pertaining to uh, dis disposable minerals. Um, so what it does, let's talk about what it does. So it does prohibit new entry to identified public lands for the purposes authorized under the mining law of 1872, and it also prohibits new entry for the purposes authorized under the Mineral Leasing Act. The Mineral Leasing Act is where we see stuff such as oil and gas leases and uh, the development of those leases and gas and coal. Uh, the 1872, that's where we're seeing stuff such as uranium, silver, and gold. So this withdrawal, if approved, would prohibit those activities from taking place. What it does not do, is it does not prohibit entry uh, to public lands for use of road-based material, humate. So those will still be available and we realize how important those are to the communities in the area to ensure that they've got some decent roads out there. Um, it does not impact valid existing rights. So if there's already a lease there and it's held by production, you know, if an operator already owns a lease, they still have the right to develop that lease. Um, it does not apply to any other minerals that are not federally owned. And when we're talking about federally owned, we're saying that are not managed by the Bureau of Land Management. It also does not impede other actions consistent with our 2003 resource management plan. A resource management plan is kind of a guiding document for the Farmington Field Office for how we manage public lands in Northwestern New Mexico. And so what this will do is it won't prohibit uh, the public or anyone else from getting a right of way out there. So if you need power, if you need water, that'll still be available to you. Um, and it also does not create a new special management area. And I think Chuck's back in business. So I'll definitely hand it back to him since this is his area of expertise. So let's go to, I think, two slides ahead. And one more, please. Perfect. And I'm going to go ahead and mute. Okay, folks, I, I really do appreci appreciate your patience with me. Uh, yeah, we, we kind of had a little glitch on, on my computer here. And so I want to take now a, a moment to talk about everything else going on. Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate uh, being tied to the Farmington District here for the last four months. And uh, I can tell you there is a lot going on in Northwest New Mexico. And what you're seeing uh, on, your, on your screens is a, a representation of some of that. Uh, do pay attention to the blue line. Uh, that's the one uh, based on that earlier map. Uh, that's, that's superimposed on this. And that is this withdrawal that we're here to talk about tonight. Other activities, if you look at the kind of the purple line outlined there, is the Farmington Mancus Gallup Resource Management Plan uh, Amendment uh, that's been underway for quite some time. And uh, so the area that it impacts is uh, from that line back to the north. 
within uh, and to support that that plan, the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, Section 106, we're working on a programmatic agreement, and that is going to be working with uh, primarily tribal uh, interests uh, in trying to get a process put in place uh, for future consultation on, on the activities that are identified within that plan. These are pretty major undertakings uh, that uh, the Farmington office has been involved with. The, the uh, Farmington Mancos Gallup Resource Management Plan also is uh, working together with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, and, and so uh, they, they are very heavily engaged and uh, part of this process. So the PA that we're hoping to develop also, as I mentioned, supports that plan. Another thing that's going on uh, in, the, in this area that is uh, not only to support this plan, but many others is ethnographic studies that are being sponsored by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, these are ongoing currently, uh, and uh, we're hoping what the, to learn out of that is also to uh, provide more information to uh, agencies to help make better decisions uh, in the future and primarily focused within the Chaco area. So go ahead and move to the next slide for me. Uh, another new one uh, is called Honoring Chaco. And you'll see that at the top of the screen. And this is something new. And uh, we're still trying to get our arms around and working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and other interior agencies. And, and what it's trying to do is create a better vision, broader vision, uh, in the cultural approach to land management decisions in, in the greater Chaco landscape. And uh, so I think as we move forward into this, you'll see that, uh, that the agencies, the tribes, uh, interested uh, parties uh, will have an opportunity to engage with us and, and other agencies as we try and make uh, uh, good decisions in the, in the greater Ch uh, landscape for Chaco. So if you'll look back at your screen, uh, you'll see uh, the two agencies of BLM and BIA represented there in, in tribal nations. And it, all the interrelationship of all of the activities going on out there. So uh, you'll see the, the FMG, what's that for instance, that is the Farmington Manco Scallop Plan. That's, that's uh, two agencies working together, outreaching uh, with, with the tribes and interested publics. You also see that uh, programmatic agreement that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, is, is serving uh, all three of them. The ethnographic studies, very, uh, very important work happening and we all will uh, gain from that. Another very important feature, uh, what you see on the screen is G2G, that's government to government uh, consultation that uh, we will be engaging with the tribes. So there's a lot going on in this area and hopefully this slide uh, helps kind of represent how they're all blending together and yet they're separate processes. Uh, next slide, please. So what comes next? So the comment period, as I alluded to earlier, uh, closes officially April 6th. Uh, we do plan on having uh, two more meetings currently uh, to allow interested public to actually be more of a hearing style meeting where we go through much the same information, but rather than open it up to questions and answers, we'd, uh, we would have a reporter available and folks could speak uh, and it would be captured and become a comment. So we'll, we're gonna compile these comments, uh, work them through and, and submit those up to the Secretary of Interior. What's very important, and I really want this to resonate with you folks out there, is we have a lot of work beyond just this process. We will be doing environmental analysis under NEPA that will also allow the public to be engaged in this process. So we're far from uh, having you uh, have that opportunity to uh, have conversation, dialogue, and make comments as we move forward in this. We do plan on uh, kicking off that NEPA here within the next month or so and, uh, and begin that process. We also have already reached out and, uh, and notified tribes of uh, the consultation available. And so we will be working on that uh, as, as we move forward. All tribes will, will be invited to the table and we will, we will have consultation with them. 
as we wrap this up, we're going to end up reporting out to Congress uh, on the process, the progress that we're making, and uh, and and let them know where we're at. Uh, our ideal timeline is within this two-year uh, segregation period, and so that's our goal currently uh, to have that done, to to provide ultimately a package for the Secretary of Interior to consider. And so. It, uh, it does land with the Secretary of Interior of whether or not to approve or deny this request. If she does approve, it would be issued as a public land order for a term of 20 years. Uh, but kind of just going back, uh, I really want folks out there to know that uh, the NEPA process will be uh, conducted for this activity. And, uh, and if you want to be involved, you will have that opportunity. Next slide. So at this point, uh, since I butchered it up earlier, I'm going to hand it back to the expert and uh, let Jill kind of take it from here. But uh, thank you, folks, and I look forward to hearing uh, your questions. Great. Thanks, Chuck. And when we opened up, I stated that we were trying to work to get Facebook Live function working, and it just did not work for us today. Uh, luckily, we did not hit our capacity. And so anyone that did register, they they did have the opportunity to join us today. And we are so grateful for those of the, those of you that were able to make it. Um, so where to find more information? The best place to start would be the BLM's e-planning webpage. So that website is there on the screen. And then uh, on there, you're gonna find the Federal Register Notice that we published on January 6th. And that really describes what this ac action is, the segregation, there's also maps and some GIS data. That's also gonna be the spot where we upload our National Environmental Policy Act documents once we get to that phase. Um, definitely keep, keep that link in your favorites and go ahead and keep up with it as we continue to add more information there. Additionally, if you're in the New Mexico area and happen to be near Farmington or Santa Fe, this information is available at both offices. The Farmington Field Office is at 6251 College Boulevard, and that's in Farmington. And then at the Santa Fe BLM New Mexico State Office, that address is 301 Dinosaur Trail. And again, that's in Santa Fe. Um, if you have additional questions about this process, please reach out to our project manager, Sarah Scott. You met her earlier. Um, her phone number is 505-564-7689, or you can email her at scott at blm.gov. And just again, Reminder, when you're calling Sarah, that's a great place to find out more information, ask your questions, uh, but probably not the best place to leave your formal comments. We're getting to how to provide your formal comments on the next slide. Um, but again, this is all being done in accordance with 43 CFR 2310, as well as the Federal Land Management and Policy Act in section 204. And if you want those resources, we're happy to give those links as well. They're right under there. If you're joining by phone, this presentation will be made available on e-planning. And so all this information will be there as well as at those uh, BLM New Mexico State Office and the BLM Farmington Field Office. Next slide, please. All right, so we are at the question and answer session. Again, this is for questions and answers. We are not taking formal comments today. That is definitely to come in the future in March. Um, that's when we can hear your uh, verbal comments that you may have for us. It'll be hearing style. We're still working out logistics as to exact dates on that and the venues for those. Uh, so stand by for more information on that. But for today, today let's go ahead and get to our question and answers. Um, you could use that raise hand function if you click on the participants tab, then you could kind of find or you could find your name and then over there, there will be a little box where you could click and you have the option to raise your hand. If you are joining by telephone, and I do see that we have quite a few folks joining by telephone, please press star nine to raise your hand and then we'll uh, call on you by the last four digits of your phone number and then to unmute yourself, it'll be star six. And I'll, I'll give those directions to you once we start going there, but we do have quite a few hands raised already. Um, 
And so we'll go ahead and just start going down the list. And up first, we have Rebecca Sobel. Rebecca, I'm gonna open your microphone and we'll do a quick mic check just to make sure everyone can hear you clearly. And then we'll take your question. Great, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll make my question quick. I was hoping that you could answer how the honoring Chaco process is going to address the impacts of decades of resource extraction in the area, but specifically the uh, designation of a en national energy sacrifice zone in 1968 and these legacy impacts related to that designation. Um, these, Im these impacts include, but aren't limited to air and water quality, orphaned and abandoned wells, public health and environmental impacts. So the question is, how is the honoring Chaco, how, if at all, is the honoring Chaco process going to address that? That sounds like a great question to kick to our district manager, Chuck Schmidt. So I, I don't know that I can directly answer your question as to how the honoring Chaco is going to address all, all those, uh, those uh, items that you brought up. Uh, do keep in mind that uh, realistically, we, we started hearing about and, uh, and, and started learning uh, what the honoring Chaco process is just recently. Uh, we're, we're still working with uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs primarily and, and uh, the department to, uh, to get our arms around exactly what uh, this process looks like. So I can't tell you that I think it's gonna directly address all of those items that uh, you issued, but I do believe what, what you will see is there'll be a lot of correspondence, a lot of coordination and a, a lot of cooperation in the G uh, greater Chaco area for future uh, uh, landscape level decisions. So th thank you for that. Thank you for your question, Rebecca. Um, and so we do have, we have 10 folks with their hands raised right now. We have uh, over 120 people joining us today. So we definitely wanna make sure that we're getting to everyone's questions. So we're gonna try to be succinct in our answers, yet thorough. Um, and again, um, go back to the slide before, if you don't mind, Teresa. I just wanna remind everyone that if we don't get to your question today, call Sarah Scott, she's available and she is more than happy to help walk you through what this is. Okay, and so our next person is Elizabeth Heath, I believe, and I'm opening your microphone. Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, are we good? Yes, I can hear you, thank okay. you. I'm curious how this whole process began, who, or what organization or organizations submitted the request in the first place? All right, I'll send that to Chuck. So the way it unfolded for us as, as the Bureau of Land Management is uh, we, we were notified by the, the Secretary of Interior's office through the proper channels of Bureau of Land Management of this, this, uh, of this process. Uh, so for us, uh, that 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 occurred when the secretary made the announcement at Chaco in uh, November. So prior to that, uh, you know, I'd be speculation on my side, uh, but uh, very much, uh, if you think about that map uh, that that we showed earlier, uh, and there was similar uh, proposed legislation in 2019. So you know, conversations have been happening but to directly answer your question uh, from the Bureau of Land Management perspective. It was handed to us as a task in November of this year, or last year. I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you. All right, great. Our uh, next hand, and once you ask your question, if you don't mind, go ahead and uh, lowering your hand so we could just make. Make sure we keep tabs on who's who's already gone and who's still waiting. So, I Bob Alay, I believe, is the name. I apologize if I did not say that correctly. No, that's correct. It, is my mic working? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, uh, given our understanding of climate science and the role of oil and gas companies, both in originally developing that science and then working to deny its consequences. My question is why you are not considering withdrawing drilling on all federal lands and, in, and, and instead, or in addition, insisting that the people 
and the companies that have profited from polluting the lands and left thousands of abandoned wells throughout the country, but definitely widely through the Chaco area, insisting that those be cleaned up instead of thinking about just withdrawing the leases on a small portion of the land. So I, I think it's important to, to keep in mind, you know, the reason for this meeting tonight is, is the scale in the, in the process that, uh, that we've been asked to and tasked with. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of your comments, uh, you know, that, that's obviously much larger in scale and, and, and a bigger uh, issue that uh, folks are, are definitely working on. And, uh, but for the, for the purpose of uh, the process we're underway right now, that is beyond the scope of what we've been tasked with doing. So, thanks. Next, we have Ms. Loretta Chi. Hello, can you hear me? I can, thank you. My question is regarding the public land order after the Secretary of the Interior approves it. Can you please explain to me what public land order means? Thank you. So at, at the end of this, if the Secretary elects to issue the public land order, that, that is basically it's a document that finalizes the withdrawal of these mineral acres. And so it would be published and notified and uh, for that 20 year period uh, removed uh, from, from entry from uh, mineral uh, mining laws and, and uh, leasing laws. And so uh, I, I hope that answers your question and I captured it right. Karina Sosi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can, thank you. Thank you. As this process continues, um, while we are completing this request for withdrawal, does that mean that there is a current hold on leasing oil and gas permits? Yeah, you would, you'd be correct. And that's that segregation process that I uh, discussed very early on. Uh, so for two years while we're going through this process, there would be no new leasing within the bounds of, uh, if you recall that map, uh, the 351,000 acres. So you are correct. Uh, Ms. Bita Sosi. Hello, thank you. My name is Beata Sosi. Um, that was part of my question that you just answered. Are there any existing wells within this um, boundaries that will have to get shut down? And if so, how many? And is that within like the two year process? Um, and then my other part of my question is, what are the, any community assurances on cleanup of existing um, existing harm that has happened within that within that boundary of withdrawal because i'll stop with those for now thank you okay i'm, I'm gonna put uh, matt on notice because i think he can actually give you some uh, statistics on that so after i kind of wrap up matt if you'll uh, finish off her, uh, her her first part of that question uh, so let's discuss valid existing rights. Uh, those, those are existing leases uh, within the area, and uh, those that hold them have the right to develop. And so those would be ongoing, uh, and, and Matt will help uh, uh, decipher and, and uh, give you the information on that. But uh, yes, that, that would be considered a valid existing right if there are current leases on federally managed minerals. Uh, as far as uh, the cleanup and, uh, and and making sure that we're we're doing our our, our due diligence to the public and, and making sure that things are, are put to bed right, that is a responsibility that that we carry right now. 
and so uh, you know, I had hope, and, and for all of you folks out there, if you if you are aware of issues that maybe we are not, please uh, get in touch with the folks here in the Farmington field office and let us know because uh, we take that uh, very seriously. And uh, if there are issues that we have not uh, completed, what needs to uh, be accomplished, uh, that that would be. Uh, very useful information that we would like to act on. And before Matt goes, uh, Ryan, you may want to take a crack at that too, as, as far as uh, some of that surface work. So appreciate it. Hey, thanks for that, Chuck. And um, yeah, there's a little bit that we can talk about with the uh, surface work associated with oil and gas development on lease. So uh, applications for permit to drill are pursuant to the onshore orders. And within that onshore order requirement for that surface use plan of operations is a discussion of both the uh, handling of hazardous materials as well as um, reclamation of the surface. So that's a portion of how the BLM does the permitting for that original APD. And then as well, when uh, I guess a spill happens on lease, there's the requirement for a lessee to report it to the BLM under what's called NTL3A. And so there's two different spill reporting requirements within that one for a major and one for a minor spill. And it's the BLM's responsibility to work with that operator to then clean that up. So if you as a you know, a person in the field are seeing a spill at a federal lease, you know, if, if you wouldn't mind, you could take a picture of it and send it to the BLM and you know, we can confirm whether or not we know about this bill, or if not, we can, you know, go ahead and, you know, try to go ahead and take care of it under that NTL 3 if it's applicable. So thanks. And Matt, are you available to assist further? I am. I'm, I'm fumbling around through a lot of uh, different programs and only two screens. So sorry about that. I am going to share my screen really quick here. Um, this will stop. Okay. Yes. That's exactly what I want to do. And just if somebody else can let me know if they see the map. It's on. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, kind of going back to your question, um, I think maybe we didn't quite target uh, your answer right. And you asked if there was like how many wells in this area would be required to shut down. And, and uh, uh, if, if I missed somebody talking about the valid existing rights already, uh, I apologize. But just to reiterate, this doesn't affect any valid existing rights. So it won't uh, cause any wells to be shut down. As far as the number of wells that are within the uh, 351,000 acres of minerals withdrawal, there are uh, existing 338 wells. And uh, of those 338, 222 are active and uh, 116 are plugged. And so you see a lot of wells are the black dots on this map, um, but the, the numbers I just gave you are for the wells that lie within the crosshatched withdrawal area. Um, so I, I think that answers your question. Great, thank you, Matt. And Teresa, if we could go ahead and get you to share your screen again. And uh, let's go ahead and put how to submit a comment slide up as well. I think two slides down from here. There we go. All right. Um, so I do want to go over this real quick. Um, just again, this is not a forum for public comments, and we've heard a lot of great questions, but uh, if you want to provide comments, the information's on this slide, online at our e-planning website, or you can send them to this email address. It's a very long one, but we definitely have folks joining by phone, so we need to read it out so everyone has the opportunity to know what that is. That email address is blm underscore nm underscore fm underscore ccnhp underscore area underscore withdrawal underscore comments at blm.gov. Or you can also mail your comments to the BLM Farmington Field Office at 6251 College Boulevard. That's in Farmington, New Mexico, 
8-7-4-0-2. A reminder that all comments must be postmarked by April 6th. Okay, we'll get back to your questions now. Um, Janine Yazi. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for that information. I have a ton of questions, but <clears throat> in the interest of time, I guess I'll just uh, focus on two major issues. In 2010, the US became signatories on, of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with conditions, and none of those conditions uh, prevent the evolution of the era of consultation to an era of consent. I've heard you repeat several times that you are going to honor consultation standards, but we know and have experienced through other processes how woefully inadequate those consultation processes are. First of all, like in 2022, not having our practicing language justice in these scoping processes is, is further uh, increasing the inequitable access or lack of access to uh, participation from the Indigenous peoples most impacted by these decisions. Um, I got reports from your in-person meetings that there was no translation available for um, to properly translate and record the comments and questions being delivered by uh, impacted Navajo communities and residents. And I'm sure this is gonna be the same way when it comes to our Pueblo relatives and the other indigenous peoples that are connected and tied to the greater Chaco landscape. Um, I want to know what is gonna be done in your future processes to ensure a more equitable scoping process to practice language justice, to ensure that you're not just seeking consultation standards, but you're actually seeking the consent of the people most impacted by these decisions. Um, because with language justice, can, will we more properly be able to combat the gross misinformation that is being spread by oil and gas interests and those who are in favor of development um, and, uh, because so much of this is not being properly explained in the native language um, of those most impacted. And, and this needs to become a standard. It is highly unacceptable that this process is still going along in this manner. Um, in addition to that, I wanna know how those these processes will uh, begin to exercise and implement the commitment by the White House established next last November on um, ensuring the inclusion of traditional ecological knowledge as an important body of knowledge that contributes to the scientific, technical, social, and economic advancements of the United States. That's a direct quote from, from um, the memorandum that was issued by the White House, and it is directly relevant to this, to this proposal as a greater Chaco landscape is a cultural, a site of cultural heritage, a sacred site for many indigenous peoples in the region. And this is a great opportunity to exercise that, that commitment from the White House. And as a federal entity, the BLM has every responsibility to figure out how to implement that in this process moving forward. Okay, so you had, you, you, Preface that correctly. You have a lot of questions, and and I really encourage you to to reach out to staff here after this is wrapped up, so so we make sure we capture all that. Uh, in the interest of, of time, you know, I I would have to go back and start researching a whole lot, and that's what staff will now be doing. Uh, but I can tell you, you know, the public or the the in person meetings that we hosted here in Farmington yesterday, we did have folks available. Uh, but I, I think what, what you might have heard is as, as uh, Navajo folks were trying to keep up with a lot of the conversation uh, as a federal agency, and, and by golly, I'm, I'm probably uh, as guilty as anybody, we use a lot of acronyms. We can confuse folks, so you're exactly right. We do need to slow it down, figure out how to get it uh, into either the native language or at least something very easily uh, deciphered. And these are very complex uh, processes and, and decisions that are, are uh, that we're working through as well. I can tell you uh, the commitment that that you have from uh, and, and and I'll speak a, a little bit on behalf of our partners with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, as we start down this path of the Greater Chaco uh, process, I think that's kind of front and center and and probably central to a lot of the. Uh, of the manners that you kind of brought forth. 
I know that there is no way I answer every one of your questions, but do know that we want to try. And as far as the, the language portion and translation, that is something that we can get better at and we plan to. And so, uh, yeah, hold us accountable to that. Please do. And and uh, and because we do want the involvement, we do want the engagement uh, of, of, of the native folks uh, that live in the area and that care about that area. And so, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we do want to remind those that are joining by phone that if they would like to ask us a question, they can press star nine on their telephones, and it will raise their hand for us, and we can open their mic. Um, next is Carol Davis. Carol, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? I had to unmute. Yes. Hello? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. There are a lot of Thank you. There are a lot of really great questions, and I really appreciate the things that Janine Yazzie just touched upon. But yes, you did mention the honoring Greater Chaco is something that you guys are trying to achieve. So to truly, to truly honor Greater Chaco, it requires a meaningful process of collaborative landscape management, which centers tribal and community consultation beyond the minimum requirements of the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106, and free prior and informed consent, as Janine mentioned earlier. And, and those all need to be part of every stage of decision making. So my question, so far, as Janine noted, these public meetings have not been accessible to many frontline community members because there is no interpretation. There are a lot of people in those communities that don't are not fluent in the English language. So, and then on top of that, the comments are not accepted orally here. And in this latest meeting, which is online, that's also a big issue because a lot of our Dine community members do not have internet access. I have broadband. And so some of what you guys are saying is coming and going. So th this is really a challenge. Virtual meetings are really a challenge when you're trying to do something like that in a tribal community. So my question, how will BLM ensure meaningful involvement in the honoring Chaco process moving forward, including in meetings related to this withdrawal? Thank you. Thank you for your meeting. And we, we definitely recognize um, that not everyone has access to broadband. Uh, not everyone can travel to town. So that's why the decision has been made to open up and have some additional outreach uh, just for this part of, of the withdrawal process, which is the very beginning. Basically, this meeting is a kickoff meeting. And so it's just, here's the information. Here's what it is. And as we continue to learn more, we really want to share that with the public as well. Uh, the BLM Farming Field Office has done very few withdrawals. And with our team here, we have experienced none. So we're learning how to do this. Um, we definitely don't want to leave our community members behind. We, uh, during our in-person session yesterday and also today, we do have some translators available if needed. But we also recognize that we presented all of this information today and none of that was translated. Um, so that is on our to-do list as well. We definitely want to ensure that those uh, that are interested, uh, that they have access to this presentation and it is in the Diné language. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Again, we will have some additional hearings where we can hear the verbal comments. Those are coming in late March. Um, we are gonna get to planning on those very early next week. We hope to have more information out then as well. And what we learned from some additional outreach last year was that it was very effective for us to do a radio broadcast show. So that is also on our to-do list. We will have a virtual hearing, we'll have some in-person hearings, and we will go on Navajo radio and ensure that we are communicating with, with folks so they can understand. And um, when it comes to our government to government consultation, that is something we are very committed to doing. Uh, we've already started some outreach on it. We look to doing, look forward to doing some uh, additional outreach. 
And the thing to know about government to government consultation is even when a decision is signed, that doesn't mean the government to government consultation stops. We are always available to talk about what happened, what lessons there were, where we're going, get feedback from our tribal nation partners to tell us their thoughts on maybe ways we could do better, maybe better ways we can do this consultation. Um, it is not our intention to do it poorly. We are growing and we may not have it right next week, but we are open to any opportunities to grow and to receive that feedback from anyone that wants to give it to us. Thank you. And we'll go on to our next uh, question, uh, Natalie Glover. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I uh, have two or three questions. Um, it, just recently in the past five years, I, I've worked quite a bit with uh, oil and gas or with environmental groups um, and monitoring and evaluating oil and gas projects. And uh, so I have some, and I've been out to some of the areas around Chaco um, and seen some of the well sites and some of the emissions. My questions are, one of the issues that I think uh, is very important to, especially the Chaco cultural site, and I'm not sure, I'm wondering if you guys have investigated this, is uh, long-term impacts of the earthquakes that will be provoked by the fracking. As you probably are aware, fracking can create fissures up to five miles horizontally. And then once those fissures are open, you know, where they pump all the solution in to open it up, then that usually creates more cracks and fissures. And that's part of how the uh, earthquakes happen, as well as the injection wells, which are going to be necessary, the waste injection wells. So I'm wondering if that has been looked into. The other thing that I know from um, many different public hearings with federal agencies is that cumulative impacts are not being included most of the time. So I'm wondering, have you and will you be looking into cumulative impacts? There are already uh, many wells in operation in that area. There are also in that area all the way up to the northern part of the Four Corners um, gas plants and other kinds of um, gas and oil operations that are producing toxic emissions with also VOCs and uh, creating wastewater and, and uh, wastewater ponds. So that's my second question. The third question has to do with who's going to be regulating the, these uh, leases that are going to be, be allowed and, uh, and that are gonna be so close. 10 miles might seem like a big radius, but when you think about that five miles that they can horizontally frack, it's not that big of a radius. So who's gonna be regulating? New Mexico Regulatory Agency, as you and probably know, I know for sure, is not capable at this time of even regulating the stuff that's already in existence, especially with what's going on down in the Permian part of New Mexico. So who's gonna, are you guys gonna be regulating and making sure that these are operating uh, as cleanly as possible? Who's going to be looking into that and taking care of that in the future? Thank you. Great, thank you for your questions. I'm gonna hand it to Ryan Joyner, our planning and environmental coordinator, Ryan. Hi, and thanks for these questions. Um, you know, I think that it's a really uh, uh, salient concern um, when you're looking at something like hydraulic fracturing or injection of like wastewater treatment, which is another thing that happens along with oil and gas development. Um, and, and you're looking at, you know, I think geology across the United States and seeing some patterns in some areas that, you know, could, could point to trends, uh, you know, including seismic activity. But Fortunately for us here in the San Juan Basin, the geology that we're working with is not conducive to that kind of seismic activity. What, you, what you're talking about with, uh, in terms of seismic activity coming from hydraulic fracturing, there, there is some micro tremoring that does happen along with the fracturing activity that, that does take place with a completion that happens from hydraulic fracturing. But the, the fracturing that would occur along with that, hydro, that the, the fissures that are occurring with that hydraulic fracturing are not perceptible to surface, nor are they uh, damaging to like a, a wellbore or a structure. What you have seen in some areas with, with 
oil and gas development back east is uh, the, the liquefaction the, of the calcium and the salt structures that are surrounding some injection wells out in like Oklahoma or Kansas and some of those areas. We don't have those geologic structures that we're working with here, nor are we injecting water on the volumes that would lubricate them. So we don't need to worry about the subsidence or the lubrication that can lead to those kinds of um, se seismic activities that, that, that have been linked in some areas to those kinds of oil and gas activities. Um, similarly, the long-term impacts that uh, occur from oil and gas activities previously under NEPA, uh, recognizing that NEPA went a kind of a sea change in the way that we talk about impacts back in 2020. So what was previously called cumulative impacts is now referred to in NEPA documents as something called reasonably foreseeable future, uh, future effects. And it's, it's, that may be where you're not seeing some of those cumulative impacts analysis directly called cumulative impacts analysis that you're used to seeing, but that is still being done as a portion of all NEPA analysis that's performed by the Bureau. Uh, it's a requirement that all, uh, all documents that are analyzing a form of an undertaking and these uh, wells, rights of ways, pipelines, leases, these would all constitute undertakings of different sizes. Uh, sorry, I'm just kind of going through here real quick and trying to make sure I'm understanding all of the uh, questions. Yeah, and then also who's regulating the leasing? So um, that's a that's actually a very good question. So the the federal mineral estates that are uh, encompassed within the withdrawal area include straight federal minerals, which are uh, leased and they are. Uh, uh, developed by, not developed, they're leased and they are administered in an inspection and enforcement capacity by the Bureau of Land Management, and that would continue. There are also some surfaces as well that have tribal trust minerals that are going to be withdrawn. Those are leased in conjunction with the BIA, and then the inspection and enforcement portion of that is done with the Bureau of Land Management. So you're still going to be seeing the same leasing uh, authorities. They would still be the Bureau of Land Management for the leasing activities, as well as the inspection and enforcement of those applications for permits to drill. Additionally, on um, the BLM surfaces that are encompassed within the withdrawal area, you know, you could still see uh, rights of ways. So those are still going to be entertained. It's not a lease right, like you would have on top of a oil and gas lease, which is there now, it's a, it's a more discretionary activity, but that's still something that's going to be uh, allowed as it's uh, open for inside of our 2003 RMP. Those uh, rights of ways and those uh, sorts of actions are still going to be available to proponents inside the withdrawal area. And uh, last, I'm just trying to go through the notes here real quick. Um, yes, and also, so, the, the, the withdrawal that we're talking about here is simply a withdrawal of those available federal minerals from future leasing activities. The, the processes that I was just discussing regarding uh, NEPA, NEPA development are what the BLM does broadly and what the Farmington Field Office also does broadly on all of our oil and gas developments and all of our undertakings. This action that we're talking about right now is explicitly pre-NEPA. So this is not, the, like, like for instance, this public meeting that we're uh, engaging in right now is not pursuant to NEPA. It's still before the undertaking has really gotten underway. So you can expect to see inside of the, an eventual environmental analysis, uh, a reasonably foreseeable future effects analysis of the impact of this uh, withdrawal. So that's something that you can look forward to inside that eventual NEPA document. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for the great question. Uh, next, we have Sony Grant. Sony, I'm opening your mic. Great, thanks. Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so my question is um, whether BLM will commit to stop permitting fracking um, in this region, in this area, the withdrawal in particular, while the process is ongoing. Um, and if not, how can BLM justify exacerbating the problem while it's in the process of studying it? Thank you. Chuck, we're not able to hear you. I'm sorry, folks. I might have to turn this question off. If you can hear me now, 
Um, I can't hear you, Chuck. So you may need to check your um, headpiece or your microphone on your laptop, make sure there's nothing impeding it. So we're gonna have to go on to Jill. Yeah, we're gonna actually kick that over to Jeff, thanks. All right, hi, Sony, can you hear me? <clears throat> or anybody? We have you. you, Jeff. All right, good. Okay, so I think the question was, are we gonna stop permitting uh, fracking or, or drilling in this case? So um, as Chuck mentioned earlier, there is gonna be a, a, a pause while some of this analysis is going on from leasing. Um, the, the entities, the lessees that still hold valid existing lease rights can still do their work out there. Um, I think that was most of the question, but let me let me see if there's some notes here that I kind of missed. Um, yeah, no, it's it's it will still be permitted on those leases that still have valid and existing lease rights. But as we mentioned earlier, there will be a pause on on future leasing, or at least for the for the duration of analyzing this withdrawal. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks everyone for continuing to work with us as we work through some of our technical issues. I do want to let you know we have 17 minutes left of today's session, and I've got 11 hands raised, so we're going to try to get through as many as we can, but again, if we cannot get to everyone, um, Teresa, go back to the, uh, for more information slide, I think it's another one up, one more up, there we go. Uh, Sarah Scott's phone number is right there, 505 five, six, four, seven, six, eight, nine. Go ahead and give her a call Monday through Friday from anytime between eight and five, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And she's happy to help uh, walk you through what this is and what it's not and answer any questions you may have. So next on our list is Joseph Hernandez. Thank you very much. And uh, I have a follow-up question for uh, Jeff. Uh, first off, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm a community member from Shiprock. I'm also the, uh, you know, one of many next generation of allottees, Navajo allottees. Uh, our allotment is, uh, my family's allotment near uh, not Nagizi. But um, the question I have is that through, through my research, um, there's over 500, uh, oil and gas industry has over 500 um, permits. And and I'm, I'm, I'm asking, is, is, is that, is that, um, data um is that is that also what the data that you guys have and how long can they hold on to those permits um then the the, the other question i have is on um the 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 economic aspect of of this of the region and eastern agency of, of navajo nation uh, are you guys is this process going to be considering you know uh working with other agencies within the federal system to help um, you know pr provide an economic opportunity or help uh, you know help communities here uh, uh, transition uh, away from the fossil fuel industry and you know partnering up with Navajo serving institutions like Navajo Tech or Diné College um, to to um, uh, help make that happen then then my last question is, will you guys be attending the Eastern Agency uh, uh, Council meeting, which will happen March 5th? Uh, this is an agency council meeting of 31 Navajo chapter, uh, local governments from Eastern Agency. Thank you. Okay, just a sound check. Can you guys hear me okay? I've, I've got my new headphones on folks, so and I, we do Sounds apologize. Great. So um, it looks like, uh, and when you say uh, permits, we're, we're, I'm going to make the assumption you're talking about uh, uh, application to permit to drill, which are good for two years uh, and can be extended uh, for one two-year extension. 
uh, and, and currently, and hopefully I'm looking at the right data here, we have about 300 uh, approved APDs, uh, primarily in Farmington, but that, a few of those do occur in the rural Perkle field area. Uh, your comment about uh, the upcoming meetings and uh, participating uh, with, with, with tribes, uh, we, we very much would like to engage on that. Uh, the meeting uh, last night, I believe uh, we were informed of that, and so, uh, we're working uh, in the background to to uh, see if if uh, for one uh, make sure that we're we're not inviting ourselves to something, but uh, more importantly uh, that uh, that uh, we're welcome there and uh, can participate. Uh, and and I apologize uh, if I missed part of your question, but but uh, we we very much uh, look forward to working with the tribes. Uh, and on your original question on the uh, permits to drill, uh, those those should be pretty good numbers. Jeff, did you want to add? Yeah, sure, Joseph. Can you guys hear me okay now? I guess I was kind of scratching last yep. time. Yep, I can hear you. Thanks. All right. Hey, Joseph, I think one of your questions about the number of permits out there, you know, we do keep very uh, good records on, on how many wells have been permitted, how many are in production, when they're being plugged, when they're, when they're uh, being abandoned, when the company is being, basically being released from that. Um, we probably don't have that for the whole Nagizi area right here, right now, but if you ever wanted to come in and visit with us on that, we could, we could, you know, show you some of that data and how that works. And I think your other part of that question was how long are those permits good for? Um, Chuck talked about, you know, when a company gets a permit, how long they have to, to drill a well, but once they've got a well in production, um, they, they can keep that well going for as long as it's producing. So just, just wanted to add that to, uh, to Chuck's response. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next is Eileen Shendo. Hello, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for all the information that's been shared. Uh, I just kind of reflecting on everything that's been said, I did want to, for your staff, especially before it's all put on to Miss Sarah Scott while everyone's on the line, you know, I just, I'm a mother. I, I'm from the Pueblos of Cochiti and Jemez and sit with a lot of sister tribes who I need to feel at times to be reminded or remind folks from governmental agencies um, that there are the Diné over and more than two, five tribes that are directly within mile radiuses of Greater Chaco. However, all 19 Pueblos have a tie and you have the uh, Hickory Apache also. And so I would ask how many of you and your staff speak Diné or Toa or Karis, or Tiwa, or Tewa. Because when you understand different languages, you process everything we're hearing in such different ways and mannerisms. And if staff is not up to that, I think that's something that staffing and as a project manager, you really need to take a look at because this has been too long that generations have been asking and fighting for these same things. The next part on this presentation is who or what part of your process is evaluating the human rights violations that have been going on and be ready to act on these by acknowledging it. And luckily I'm glad that the gentleman, Mr. Hernandez spoke up because in your honoring Chaco process in your three bubbles that intertwine about six or seven agencies, you still leave out the independent allottees. And so I know you say governmental and tribal consultation, which I would really caution you each to, and how you easily throw that word consultation around, because I think that's what governmental agencies have created to phrase out what they're trying to do with tribes when it undermines the true sovereignty and the federal, federal relationship you have with any other country, because we are our own countries within this one. And so 
who or what part or where in your staffing or in this process, whether it's at the local level or when you're giving it to the interior or when they're, we're going to be talking to Congress, who is truly sitting there remembering all the complexities of these dynamics. So why is Mr. Hernandez or the hundreds of other Alatis who are now in different generations and different mindsets to make decision for their land? Why are they not one of those bubbles? Why are they not part of that process intentionally? Because if some of you are new and another question I'd ask each of you to reflect on is how much, and I think I, I really wanna ask Mr. Joyner, how long have you lived in the greater Chaco region? In terms of how many generations do you have living there and have experienced because what just was said to me was a very misconstruing argument he gave back about the other woman's comment in regards to fishers. Because when you talk to generations on generations or we've lived in these areas, we're seeing it. So again, cautionary in how you're approaching, talking to what I hope and, and will soon to be more of our elders and especially our youth. Um, again, a few questions. Who's evaluating the human rights violation? Why aren't Alatis and other entities such as independent, na na like individuals, sovereign bodies like myself who are indigenous to these lands first and foremost, why are they not getting an individual process or being acknowledged as that individual process? Because they're obviously being acknowledged as individual right holders by these leasees who want to come in and, and take this land in a, a way that would profit them. Um, and then again, how are you going to for sure make sure that when you're working with tribes, it's a direct, direct, and also because there's 19 other Pueblos, I would hope that you don't just invite in one forum for all these Pueblos to come together, but you go to each of these 19 tribes and then you also invite community members because not all tribal members speak for each of us. And a lot of times, even our own tribal members don't have all the resources to be attending these but we are also U.S. government citizens and have the right for you to pay attention to our comments and thoughts and experiences. Okay, let me let me take a crack. You, you had a lot there. Um, first and foremost, I really need you to take the time and write some comments down for us or participate in this upcoming hearing because uh, I think you're making Im important points. Uh, as far as staffing uh, and, and uh, folks, I can't. I can tell you, there's not a more dedicated uh, staff available that uh, is, is trying their darndest uh, to understand all of these complexities. As far as the the makeup of who they are, we've got a nice cross section, and and uh, we do have Nav Navajo natives, and we do have some uh, uh, of all ethnicities, and and so you know, let's let's not th let that drive the dynamic as to who's working within the office. More importantly, let's let's figure out how to move forward in the future and capture a lot of the important comments that you're making. How do we how do we capture that and and those complexities and and hear the voices of uh, really everybody that's uh, impacted by these decisions? I do want to remind folks. First off, we're down to about five minutes, and and so let let's try and cover as many questions as we can. Uh, but more importantly, just to follow up, one more comment. We are always looking for uh, for help and quality help, and and please encourage tribal members to come uh, and, and entertain working for the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies because I think that will make a big difference too. So with that, I'm going to move on. We'll uh, take the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Robin Jackson. Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is, what types of public announcements and outreach will you provide to local indigenous communities to ensure adequate public engagement and that their comments are incorporated in the Honoring Chaco initiative? I did hear you mention earlier um, you were thinking of doing a radio announcement or so if you could explain more about um, everything you're going to do. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that the information is getting out. Uh, we, uh, you know, we just started talking last night. It was a suggestion at our meeting last night that we do consider doing another Navajo uh, translated radio program. And so we we do not have the details lined out exactly how that's going to look. That session is going to start taking place very early next week for us to line out all those details, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And once that's available, we'll definitely get the information out there. How do we get the information out? Um, we had some really great suggestions last night as well, um, making sure that we have flyers available at all chapter houses. Um, we do send out press releases, but maybe we need to start looking at getting some of those press releases translated and played on the radio stations. Um, and we're open to ideas that you may have on how we could do better at getting this information out. Um, like I said earlier, um, we may not be doing it justice right now, but we definitely wanna work towards getting the information out better and ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to engage if they choose to engage. Um, so right now we're looking at the radio station to advertise, we'll be doing press releases. We have our Facebook page, it's uh, Bureau of Land Management-New Mexico. Uh, every press release we do, we also post that on that page. Um, and you know, maybe we take out a newspaper advertisement as well, just to ensure that it is getting in and getting published. Um, but again, if you have ideas, please reach out to us and uh, share them with us so that we can ensure that information is getting out. And regarding the honoring Chaco process, um, I believe that those same opportunities will be there. We are working, um, the Department of the Interior is really heading that up. So how they're gonna go about for engaging on that, um, They'll let us know where our role is, and we can also encourage that they choose some of these same methods that we're doing and anything else you share with us for ideas. Um, we'll continue to share those as well. Okay, let's go to our next question. We are getting really close on the end of the hour. Um, we'll try to get to a couple more questions. Um, so let's get to it. How about Donna House? Yeah, uh, um, I have a couple of things that I want to say first. Um, I have been to many of your hearings over the decades, and as time has come to now, your hearings have gotten worse. It's reduced public input greatly from my perspective um, as far as tribal input. So as far as comments, I really stress that you change and develop a new public hearing that actually engages local communities. I stressly say that your public hearing should reflect and be within each cultural tribal context and within the community's context. You need to go out to the communities rather than communities come to you. As stated earlier by various people, there's no resources out there that, that can keep, that can bring people to BLM Farmington. Another piece here is of all the resources that are out there, I have not seen any of our community-based research, our cultural research that is out there. That is something that really needs to be considered as far as part of your resource management plan. So I would like to know Another piece is what's your timeline on NEPA? And I know that earlier you gave how many wells were out there and that to me is something that needs to be in your front page of your website. So big picture here is you need to have a new way of talking and engaging the local communities for public hearings. Thank you.
Okay, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, obviously, and, and, and we have talked uh, just a bit on unengaging uh, the, the Native communities, and, and we're doing our best, and, and, and we can improve. Uh, Jill just mentioned, uh, I believe, after, after the last question, great suggestions, and, and really encourage you to, to contact us and, and make these suggestions. If it's something that we can pull together, we, we very much want to uh, attempt to do that. Uh, on, on the NEPA timeline, uh, we will be uh, kicking the NEPA for this withdrawal off within probably a month is, is where I, I'm anticipating. We've got to get through these meetings first. Uh, we've committed to more, uh, especially with that uh, hearing style meeting, yeah, but we will shortly uh, start, start up that NEPA process. And the goal, uh, if you remember early on in the presentation with the segregation process is two years, we'd like to have that done and presented to, uh, to Congress and, and uh, up to the secretary's office for consideration within that two year timeline. Uh, so, so with that, hopefully that answered most of your questions, uh, but I, I do encourage you if we can do better, please let us know. And if, uh, if you can provide some comments that would very much be appreciated as well. So thank you very much. Okay, um, Rosemary Blanchard. Hello, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Oh, good. Um, I, my question, I, 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 first off, I want to congratulate you on being more prepared in regard to issues involving indigenous sovereignty and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People than you were at the last BLM meeting I went to, which was during the Obama administration, when Obama had just uh, said that the US would follow the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in all of its government functions. And yet the representatives from the BLM, this was a public hearing in Albuquerque about uh, rights of way across BLM land, which evidently is still going to be an issue, even if this land is withdrawn. Uh, and absolutely nobody knew what the declaration was or how it might apply to what was going on. And the person holding the meeting said, well, you know, there's been a lot of laws lately. So you're in far better shape than that. But as someone who is a member of an ally community, a faith community in Albuquerque that you know wants to do the right thing, uh, I'm struck by the fact in the announcement that on the one hand, many community people in Eastern Navajo are saying this, that without having the, the land set aside, uh, our way of life is really undermined. And yet some representatives of the Navajo Nation government, the council speaker was, was mentioned in your, your uh, announcement, say that, uh, that they they want to see only a five mile uh, limit and want to have more development. Now, my question is, in the government to government relationship and in the uh, relationship under UNDRIP with uh, indigenous communities, how are you balancing the various communities of interest which include tribal governments, including the Navajo Nation government, include community members, not all of whom are Alatis, and include Alatis who have different points of view. And how are you going to deal with the BLM land as, as it intersects with some of these uh, allotments where people want to give uh, mineral development authorization, but where that authorization may impact aquifers underneath more than just their allotment. So, I mean, that, that's a lot to deal with, but I'm curious as an ally who wants to be supportive of indigenous self-determination and sovereignty, how are you addressing these conflicts within the indigenous nation itself? Great question. And, and I have to tell you, I'd, I'd like to put you on the payroll tonight. And, and, 
you you captured the complexity of management in this checkerboard area that surrounds the Chaco uh, Park and and the Greater Chaco region. You've got uh, you've you've got the tribal lands. You've got the Navajo Trust lands. You've got the Indian allotted lands. You've got Bureau of Land Management, state lands, private lands, and and everybody uh, obviously um, is not in agreement on how to manage it, and and so. Very much. This is this is kind of what's kept me very engaged in my career. Is uh, you've got a lot of interests out there, and you've got to figure out a balance and, and try your best. The action that we're here to discuss tonight is withdrawal of the mineral estate of three hundred fifty-one thousand acres. That's that's making a pretty uh, bold commitment to those resources or lack thereof, if you want to look at it in that light. Others out there. Uh, obviously, as you just captured, may have different ideas. They may think, uh, yeah, let's let's uh, let's let's follow that path on other lands. As a BLM representative to you tonight, I can tell you we have to stay in our decision space. I cannot alter what an Indian allotment uh, and how they choose to manage that. We have no we have no decision space there. Can we have continued conversation, which is what I believe the Greater Chaco uh, uh, process is just hatching? Absolutely, can we we can do that. But at the end of the day, we we, we know our lanes as the Bureau of Land Management. This three hundred fifty one thousand acres is what we're uh, attempting uh, to analyze and uh, submit the package to the to the Secretary of Interior to approve the various tribes, the, the various folks. Uh, and there is a lot of people that are very passionate about this area. And, and uh, we understand that. And, and trying to strike that balance is, is a difficult process. I think it goes bigger. It's, it's bigger and goes beyond this 351,000 acre withdrawal. And this is gonna be, uh, uh, as, as we push forward into the future, these are the conversations that we need to have and, and, and move forward. Reeling you back in for tonight's purposes, we are focused on that 351,000 acres of federal minerals, but you do capture a very valid point that uh, th this is the conversation and dialogue that needs to be happening as we move forward. So thank you for that. Mario Atencio. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, my, my question is going to be involving uh, the fact sheet. And I think last night, um, um, this I would have a two-parter here. Uh, we really need um, um, some of, um, especially the re re reasonable foreseeable development document, and all the all the all the relevant documents that are that are being discussed need to be put into a central archive. And I guess when you're going ahead with this, um, all of those are just incredible background information for people that are that we want to understand this issue more. Um, as you've seen a great need for people to, to know what these documents are. <clears throat> and, and second, uh, my second question um, that, that was sort of a was request. And as my question is going to be after thinking about this, how and um, the tar Department of Interior submitted a detailed plan for improving interiors implementation of Executive Order 13175. Um, and I see in the, there's a consultation section in the in your three bubble deal. Um, how is how are how is the BLM Farmington Field Office going to uh, take the findings of this report and implement it because as a local elected leader, this plan barely fits and in, in, uh, it, it's a very, very, very elementary first start for talking about uh, what's going to happen. And I think um, this would really uh, lower the temperature down uh, in these meetings, um, that's just that's just my uh, a question I have. So thank you. Okay, Mario. Uh, 
you caught me a little bit flat footed and I'm just going to admit it. Uh, I'm going to have to look into that actual executive order and report that you're talking about. What I really recommend, and, and, and you know my staff well, and I really hope that you can contact, uh, you know, reach out to Sarah Scott, uh, Jeff Tafoya, others uh, that you well, well know, and, and let's just work through that because we, we, we got to get this right. And, and, uh, and, and so I, I definitely want to get your question answered. I don't have the answer for you right now. And uh, in, the, in the spirit of time, let's, let's, uh, let's try and get you in contact with folks and, and uh, just take it. And Jill, I'm not sure how much time we, we're still going, but if you want to try and open up for one more question, at least uh, I think it'd be appreciated. Great. Uh... Our next question is from Kyle Smith. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, good. Uh, yeah, I have uh, several questions. Uh, the first one is, you know, how long would these, uh, would this withdrawal be in, in effect? And then the second one is there, is there anything being done to ensure that it will last longer? And also, like, what kind of uh, uh, amendments could possibly uh, happen to the the plan in the future? Like, if some you know crazy elected leader comes along and decides to change a lot of things, what 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 kind of um, extra things would be in place to prevent you know uh, uh, very important and major uh, decisions from being changed? Okay. And oh, sorry. So. Uh, how many people are actually uh, working on this plan from the, the actual BLM? And also uh, from uh, the, about the fracking uh, question uh, earlier addressed by Ryan Joyner. He said that this was not, a con the area was not conducive to hydraulic fracturing, but uh, I was uh, you know, looking at the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources and the seismic network that's in the New Mexico region. And it's not, uh, I feel like there's not enough seismic instruments in the area to actually really kind of say that, like would the BLM consider putting a seismic instrument in the Chaco area to ensure that it is being well studied and um, proved from being um, uh, protected against, you know, this, these earthquakes. And that's it. Thanks. Okay, I was doing my best to jot them all down. Uh, you had several in there. Uh, your first question, I believe, was uh, how long will this last uh, as proposed uh, and, and under the authority of uh, the Secretary of Interior would be for a 20 year span. Then I think you followed up with that. Can it be reversed? Uh, well, pretty much uh, anything other than laws and subsequent laws to, uh, to that amend, pretty much any action like this could be reversed, but I would think you would see this very same process have to be invoked to reverse uh, prior to the end of that 20 year uh, span. To make it last longer, I think that was your, your third question, uh, that would take an act of Congress in, in a law passed. And so uh, those are the three. As you transition in your question on fracking and uh, some of the comments uh, in the what, what uh, you heard uh, Ryan Joyner report out, I think you might have misinterpreted just a little bit. He was uh, specifically, he kind of took you down the, uh, the geology path and, and what, what the, the, the subsurface in the R region uh, reacts versus what you were seeing uh, in, in the earlier question on say the Oklahoma. I mean, it, it is a very much different landscape. Uh, fracturing is common, folks. It is common here in, in Northwest New Mexico. Uh, water production, what you do with those waters and a lot of the injection wells that uh, from my reading have uh, triggered a lot of this seismic activity uh, is much more prevalent in those other zones. Uh, I do not want to get in the way of, of uh, somebody that knows this much better than myself. I highly encourage you to reach out to our staff and, and try and learn and get uh, as much information so you can so you can be better prepared on these comments. Uh, but as this pertains to withdrawal, I, I think uh, uh, I, I've got I've got probably the base of your questions on how long it lasts can it be reversed and, and so thank you for the question.
All right, we have three people left. These will be our last three questions that we take for the night. And then we will go ahead and close up. So uh, Julia Bernal. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? I can't, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for everybody that's um, asked a question tonight and you know engaged in this process. Um, real quickly, um, regarding the BLM ethnographic study, I would just like to know um, if that proposal um, has been vetted out um, to an outsourced entity and um, if this process is also considering the tribally led ethnographic studies. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. If, if I led anyone to believe that uh, that that was a BLM led, led uh, project, it's it's very much it. I think we're talking about the same thing. It is uh, it is uh, being sponsored by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Ethnographic Studies, and they are heavily engaged with the with the various tribes in that process. So I think we're on the same page for that one. That is a BIA driven uh, ethno study. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Leona Morgan. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Great. Um, Yat A, hello, thank you for um, hearing my questions. I have two questions. Um, first one, I'm, I'm just wondering when or uh, what Navajo chapters will you plan to do uh, public comment sessions at? Um, so that's the first question. And then also, when, when can we see a timeline with the details of the Honoring Chaco Initiative? Uh, we, when can we see that provided to the public? Thank you. Oh, and, I, and just for the record, I am a Diné person with a future home less than 20 miles, well, within the 20, 25 mile range of Chaco. Um, thank you. Great, right, and thank you for your question. Um, so right now we're uh, we're still planning what those outreach sessions are going to be and where we're, where we're going to hold them. Um, so likely, if we do go out in that area, it'll probably be a chapter house that's within the proposal area. And so that's one part of it. Your second question was the timeline for honoring Chaco. That's a little unclear now. This is very new. Um, a lot of it's happening at the Department of the Interior level, and so they're they're sharing with us as they're gaining new knowledge and an understanding for it. So we look forward to getting more information on it and uh, we're sure that that'll be also shared publicly. Okay, uh, Donna House. I'm sorry, the question I asked was asked earlier. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Leona Morgan. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I just, just to clarify, I asked which chapters and, and you specified a chapter. Does that mean you're only going to one chapter? No, or you don't know which chapters. I, I apologize if that's what I implied. It's unclear right now, we're, we're just very, it's very unknown what that's going to look like right now. And so it is not saying we're only going to one place. But one thing to also keep in mind is if you are a part of a chapter house and you want to receive information on us that you think could be, from us that you think would be beneficial to your chapter house, please reach out. We definitely want to get that information to you if we need to go out and provide that information. Um, and we also one thing to really keep in mind too is this, what we're doing today and what we did yesterday, this is just kicking off this process. We haven't even gotten into the NEPA public engagement side. So there's gonna also be additional opportunities to engage, share with the public what we know, because by the time we get there, we're gonna know even more and it'll be great information for us to share with you. Um, so continue to stay engaged and we look forward to engaging with you throughout this process. But uh, you're right, we have not decided which chapter or chapters um, these sessions may be held at. Thank you. And last question for the night, this will be the last one we take is from Rebecca Sobel. Um, oops, sorry, Rebecca. Oh, you just, 
I, I'm sorry, Rebecca, you left. There you are. Okay. Great. Uh, and thanks for letting me speak again. I just wanted to ask just a question um, with maybe a little bit commentary. A lot of us have said the things that we're saying many times before related to this process, including um, specifically 2016, 2017 with the 10 BLM scoping meetings around the um, RMPA. And, some, and that scoping report is multiple thousands of pages um, and represents a few thousands of comments. So my, my question, I, I know you've asked us all to, to submit written comments, which, I'm, which I know we will all do, but my question is also to what extent have the comments that have already been submitted related to oil and gas leasing in the greater Chaco area going to be considered? And I ask that also because we have some some, there are some elders and really expert people that are no longer with us that have submitted comments and testimony that must be considered and has been a part of the record. But much of the staff, uh, especially in BLM Farmington, is no, that were there are no longer there. I'd say all of the staff that were there in that 2016-17 scoping session mostly are not there now. So the question is like, what can do we need to be resubmitting things that we've already submitted to the record? Protests on lease sales, um, people's hearings, scoping comments, et cetera. Um, again, maybe the better way to ask that question is to what extent are you including previous comments on oil and gas drilling and leasing in this area as part of this process? Okay, another good question. <clears throat> you sure you don't wanna come submit a resume or something? So folks, the, the unfortunate part is just the process that we're running. And, and what I've got to tell you, and you may not want to hear it, is this is different than you, you brought up the, the resource management plan amendment and the, and the monumental task and, and all of the comments and, and this is a separate process. Now, ordinarily, I would tell you, yeah, we should be able to, to uh, uh, kind of fast track short circuit and, and find an avenue to simplify that and, and ensure that your comments were captured. However, early on in this process, we talked about how this is being applied under a different regulation and, and under a different subsection of FLIPMA. And so this, this will become a report generated that we move up to Congress and ultimately to the Department of Interior and the Secretary of Interior. So it is a complete separate package. So, you know, uh, uh, if you would, uh, and please don't, you know, rewrite every comment you've ever done because we want them to be substantive, but do comment on this one uh, because it, it's an important one and, and it is different and, and those comments would uh, be appreciated. So thanks for that. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, receive this information. I hope we've been able to provide some clarification about what this is. And again, if you have additional questions about this, please reach out to our public, our project manager, Sarah Scott. Her phone number is 505-564-7689. Or you can email her at scott at blm.gov. And before we close out, I just want to remind you how to provide your comments. And we are accepting them uh, with a postmark date to up to April 6th. So they must be postmarked by April 6th. You may submit them to the BLM's e-planning webpage. You may also email them to BLM underscore NM underscore FN, FM, I'm sorry, underscore CCNHP underscore area, underscore withdrawal, underscore comments at blm.gov. You may also email or mail them to the BLM Farmington Field Office at 6251 College Boulevard. That's in Farmington, New Mexico, 87402. And also please stand by to receive additional information about upcoming sessions for the hearings. And then again, as we enter into our NEPA process, we'll definitely have additional opportunities there for public engagement. Thank you again for your time and we look forward to the next time we get to talk with you.